thrilled to welcome Wendy Kopp here at the summit. Wendy is the CEO and co-founder of Teach for All, which is a global network of organizations in over 60 countries across the world that's working to develop collective leadership to ensure all children have the opportunity to fulfill their potential. Uh, she's previously founded and led Teach for America, uh, which as you likely know is an organization that enlists, develops, and mobilizes America's most promising future leaders to grow and strengthen the movement for educational equity and excellence through teaching across the country in our most under-resourced communities. Uh, and Wendy's going to be uh, on stage with Kaya Henderson leading the conversation. Kaya is the CEO and co-founder of Reconstruction, which is an online platform uh, delivering supplemental K-12 curriculum that highlights black people, black culture, and black contributions to our country and our world so that students of all backgrounds uh, benefit from a more complete understanding of our shared history and society. Uh, she's also a co-host of the podcast Pod Save the People and previously served as chancellor of DC Public Schools. We are thrilled to have them both here. This is gonna be a really great conversation, so please give them a warm welcome, Wendy and Kaya. Good afternoon. Very excited to be here today with the Lifetime Achievement Award winner my friend, Wendy Kopp, um, who I personally think is a national and now international treasure. Um, in fact, there are many of us in this room who would not be sitting here today if it wasn't for the boldness and that that's right, give it up. So today we get to learn some nuggets of wisdom from this 30 plus year journey. Um, and I wanna start by asking you, what problem were you trying to solve? What was your theory of the problem in education when you started Teach for America in 1990? First of all, Kaya, thank you so much. And thank all of, all of the, the fans in, in the room. It's a true honor to, to be here with all of you. Um, you know, Kaya, when I was starting out, this, this, was, this came about not necessarily because I understood well, I, I was trying to address the inequities in our country, but the inspiration for this idea was that as a college senior, all the recruiters were banks and consulting firms banging down our doors, asking us to commit just two years to work in their firms. And I didn't want to do that. And I felt that I was one of thousands of people out there who were searching for something else, for a way to make a real difference in our country, to address the inequities in our country. And that's what led to this idea. Um, you know, why aren't we being recruited as aggressively to commit, quote, just two years to teach in our country's urban and rural public schools? So that was really the first inspiration. And I became so obsessed because I thought it would make a real difference for kids growing up today. And also, it would change the priorities of our generation, right? Like if our first two years out of college are teaching in low-income communities instead of working on Wall Street, that was gonna make a long-term difference. So that was the original idea. How's it going? I feel so lucky to have landed on that idea 34 years ago um, and to have had the chance and continue to have the chance to work alongside so many people to build this effort. Um, I couldn't have un understood, I think, what I had landed upon. Um, so we've learned a lot over time. Okay, talk a little bit about that. Um, in 1990, you thought, if I just put amazing teachers, get inspire America's college graduates to teach for two years, things would change. Is that still true, or how has your thinking evolved over time? I think what I couldn't have fully understood is just how the impact those two years would have on the teachers themselves, right? Like the way those two years would transform everything from people's beliefs and mindsets and priorities to their career trajectories and the degree to which those people would, would just never leave the work and would end up you know, being many of the leaders we need, working alongside many others, but working at every level of our education systems, of policy, advocating for change from outside the system, innovating on, on the kind of, you know, solutions that we need to make up for the gaps in the system. Um, essentially, they've become, I mean, I think I've come to believe that with enough leadership, we, we can change any system. What we need is collective leadership, like what we've come to call collective leadership, meaning 
people around the whole ecosystem around kids, a diverse group of those folks, particularly led by people who themselves have experienced the inequities we're working to address, and their allies who have a lot more privilege, who are stepping up from their individual pursuits and learning together, you know, in relationship with each other, collaborating with each other. Ultimately, if we have that kind of leadership, we can create much more just systems that actually set kids up to, to thrive in today's world. The idea of collective leadership is kind of revolutionary. We actually don't train leaders in the Western space to lead collectively. We are looking for the charismatic hero who comes with a vision and is gonna save the world and get everybody motivated around that vision and whatnot. How do we shift that model of leadership to be more collective? So I think it starts in our classrooms, actually. I mean, now all around the world, we're working to say, how do we develop students as leaders who can shape a better future? Which means we need to develop their sense of agency and awareness of themselves and the world and their sense of connectedness to each other and their well-being and their problem-solving and critical thinking skills. And we just know that the kind of systemic adaptive challenges we face as a society, which they are going to need to solve, will require collective leadership. Like we need a lot of individuals, but working together in relationship with each other to actually tackle the complex challenges ahead. So 20 years later, you started Teach For All. What was the impetus for going international? So, um, I had my head down, I was fully focused, maybe we were 15 years into Teach for America, and of course, you know, still addressing the massive challenges in this country, and I was trying, alongside many others, to make Teach for America bigger and better. I hadn't even thought about the rest of the world. There was something in the water in the rest of the world. I mean, within one year, I met 13 people from 13 different countries, one thing or another had just led them to reach out and say, we really need something like this in India, in China, in Chile, in you know, the next place. Um, and they were looking for, for help. And you know, one of those people who ended up founding Teach for India, whose name is Shaheen Mistri, somehow convinced me to go to India. She's like, you have to just come to India and see what I'm talking about and, and help think this through. So I did that, which seemed like a total stretch, like how am I gonna find a week in my life to go to India? And when I got there, you know, on the plane I was thinking, this makes no sense. Like, India is so different, right? Like, what have I learned that could possibly be relevant? The first thing we did was visit a school. And that visit led me to realize that the issues we're addressing are, are so similar from place to place, that as different as the culture and context of India is, the circumstances facing those kids who were growing up in the slums of Mumbai were more similar to the circumstances of the kids in the South Bronx than to the more privileged kids in their own country. And when the school principals started explaining to me, you know, why there was only so much she could do, which is something that at that point I had heard probably hundreds of school principals explain in, in this country, I realized, you know what, it would be so short-sighted to have all these people just go off on their separate ways and pursue this in a way that doesn't enable us to learn from each other. Because if the roots of the issues are so similar, the solutions are much more shareable than we've assumed. And so that's what led to this idea of Teach for All as, and, and of to setting it up as a network of now independent, locally-led organizations in 60 countries, 30 more in the pipeline, you know, who are all adapting this similar approach to developing collective leadership in their countries with a global organization that's helping everyone, you know, not only the staff members, but the teachers and alumni learn from each other across borders. So I've had an up-close and personal experience with Teach for All, having attended global conferences and then actually coming on to work for Teach for All because at some point the mothership calls back. Um, 
But help these people understand what you are seeing out in these other countries. What are people doing? Give them some stories from the front line that help them understand the magnitude of this network. Hmm. Um, I wasn't expecting that question. You know, um, we have network partners everywhere from Afghanistan to Ukraine and, and a lot of places in between. Um, those 60 network partners are, are in such diverse contexts around the world. Um, so Teach for Afghanistan, I mean, I think their fellows have been out of school for about one week since August when the Taliban took charge. And I say that because it just kind of shows the power of locally rooted leadership. I mean, these fellows moved into primary schools. They're still keeping the secondary girls learning by helping them gain access to learning materials in their homes. And they are going at this work and trying to help as many kids as possible be, get the kind of education that we all know is ultimately going to be crucial for a thriving Afghanistan. And I just think about all those Teach for Ukraine teachers who immediately went back to remote instruction and have kept alongside many other Ukrainian educators, you know, millions altogether of kids learning in their own languages and, and whatnot. So I guess what we see all over the world is just the power of locally rooted people um, who are just all in on helping the next generation, you know, thrive. There are people who I think have criticized Teach for America, criticized Teach for All um, for lots of different things. With 30 plus years of perspective, what do you want those folks to understand now that you couldn't articulate before? Um, so I think, I think you have to understand the full on theory of change of Teach for America or any of these Teach for All network partners in order to, to really believe it, like to believe in it. Um, it's not about two years of teaching, right? Like it's about two years, and most of you all in this room know that. It's about those two years and every year after the two years. And what those people go on to do, working with so many others in the system to actually to tackle a, a deeply entrenched problem that in many, many places for decades and decades we've seen no progress against, right? Ultimately, we need more than any one thing to change a system. Like fixing teachers doesn't change a system. Like fixing any one thing doesn't work, right? Like ultimately, we need to actually change, we need to change a lot of things and that's gonna take a lot of leadership. And what I think we've seen through this approach, and I have to say that you know, it was so surreal initially to see the same effects playing out in all of these very diverse places around the world. I mean, you could be in Nigeria, you could be in Peru, you could be in the next place, and the leadership effects, like the hearts, minds, and souls drawn to the work, the degree to which those people make an impact in their classrooms and schools, the degree to which that experience changes them, even the data points, like all across our network, it's like, doesn't matter what country you're in, these folks are gonna come in unsuspectingly committing, quote, just two years and 70% of them will never leave education, right? I mean, it was so surreal that we finally decided, let's look at this with, like, let's get some researchers to try to understand what is happening to the teachers during those two years. And that research has just been fascinating because it's even challenged and expanded my own understanding of what, what it is that we're doing. So it turns out, it's not just that we're enlisting a whole bunch of people who might not otherwise have put their energy into this arena and they're people, very diverse group of folks with a lot of leadership potential. It's that those two years change the way they see things. Like they lead them to believe more in their students and in the potential of kids and families in low-income communities. They lead them to believe more in their own potential to make a difference. They lead them to move from thinking 
the solution is one thing. I mean, all over the world, these folks come in thinking funding's the number one thing, and of course, funding is very important, but they come out thinking, whoa, this is a massively complex, systemic, you know, challenge that's going to need a lot of adaptive change. So, and their priorities completely shift, right? Like their career trajectories change. Um, so what you realize is this is really creating the leaders we need, right? Like people who believe so much in their students, who have a sense of possibility, who get that there's no one silver bullet solution. So it starts to make sense why from place to place to place, they assume really significant leadership roles in, in these efforts, at, even at a really young age. Um, so I guess that's what I would say. I mean, I think there's an idea out there that system change, I mean, we all know we need system change, like to tackle the inequitable and terribly outdated system that we have, right? And people think, well, system change is policy change. But what, what you really know, I mean, everyone in this room knows, like the only way to change aggregate outcomes in a place is to change policy, but also practice and culture. And that's why we need collective leadership, right? Like we need people exerting leadership in government, but if they don't have their allies working at every other level of the system and advocating for change outside the system and innovating on the gaps in the system, like if we don't have collective leadership, we will not get the system change we need. And what we've learned over time is that it is possible to intentionally cultivate that collective leadership. And that's really what this effort is all about. Where have you seen or are you seeing that most prominently? So, um, I mean, we're really, when I say we're seeing the same movie playing, um, and maybe some of you have been in these different countries and you've seen all those Teach for India alums, now thousands of them in and around, like exerting leadership, or you've seen even in the early years of Teach for Nigeria that these folks are already working in those government ministries and have already launched countless social innovations and are working at every level. Um, so I, it's hard to pick one, but I'm just going to share a recent experience. I was just in Cambodia, and um, I don't know how many people have their heads around the history in Cambodia, but there was a terrible genocide which literally killed 80% of the country's educators, and, and that was, you know, recent recent history, you know, in our lifetimes. And the system is just terribly under-resourced and still terribly under capacity. Um, an incredible guy named Moni Siv, um, who, who <laughs> bizarrely, I mean, is from Cambodia, grew up in a low-income context there, got a scholarship, went to one of the best schools on this scholarship, ended up coming to Wash U and of all things, joining Teach for America and teaching for three years in Camden but every day thinking to himself, I've got to bring this back to Cambodia. So they're still early in their journey, right? Like they're only five or six years in and it's really challenging to operate there. So they have a grand total of 100 alumni of Teach for Cambodia and probably the oldest of them, right? Like they're like 26. <laughs> um, so I was just there and, you know, 30 of those 100 folks are staffing the National Education Reform Initiative. So the university, Royal University of Phnom Penh, is running a massive ed reform initiative, which is retraining every teacher and every school principal in the entire country. And they have 60 staff members and 20, actually 20 of them are, are Teach for Cambodia alums. And I met with some of them and they said, but just to be clear, we're managing everyone else. I mean. And, and you talk to the dean of the Royal University of Phnom Penh, and, and he says, I couldn't do it without the Teach for Cambodia alums, like the leadership skills that they bring, but also their understanding and relationships they bring from having taught through Teach for Cambodia. And then you start meeting everyone else, like a full-on 70 of them are working at every level of this system. They're the teacher trainers in, in networks of schools, they're working in the ministry in charge of policy and many other things. They're leading the biggest STEM, STEAM education reform initiative in the country. I mean, already they are collective leadership, right? Like they are, and they're all working together, trading solutions, problem solving together, and partnering importantly with a lot of other people in, in the system. So it truly, like when I say the same movie is playing, I mean, it's what we've seen and continue to see 
you know, here in the U.S. in communities where Teach for America has placed people for 20 or 30 years. And you just imagine taking all those Teach for America alumni out of those communities. Um, and you would just take away a lot of the energy and leadership that has contributed alongside many other things to, to the incredible progress that we've seen in some of the urban and rural communities here. As we wrap up, um, we are at an, a point of inflection perhaps in education in America with the advent of um, artificial intelligence, we're in the midst of the culture wars, we're still recovering from the pandemic. What word of hope do you have for these people as they retreat from this conference and go back into the real world? So, um, the, my biggest thought right now is that as educators, we truly have the biggest role to play in reshaping the world. And I think we need to pause and really reflect on that. Like, what I mean by that is that, um, so, so a few years ago, thanks to, and this is the power of the global work, right? Like, thanks to the push of all these people across the network who kept asking, what exactly do we mean by excellent education? And what is it that we're all really working on together? We came together and we've grown from a network partner in the US, Teach for America, and Teach First in the UK to 40 network partners in 40 countries. And we came together in this big process to say, okay, what are we all working to accomplish together by 25 years from now? And because we framed the question that way, we started with the question of where will the world be in 25 years? And you realize when you ask that question how much uncertainty there is and also how many challenges we face, like how much the planet is degrading, like these, how much the economy is changing, just so many challenges. And it really brought into stark relief the fact that if today's students are not developing as leaders, you know, developing holistically, right? Like in a way that will enable them to solve those increasingly complex problems and shape meaningful careers in this changing economy, there's no hope for any of our aspirations, right? For peace, for sustainability, for justice. So it led to a real reorientation of our purpose as a global community to say, okay, so we're reorienting our vision, and it, it, we're going to work towards the day when all students have the education, support, and opportunity to shape a better future for themselves and all of us. And it's, it's, it's actually led to a huge reorientation, like re, even redoing all of our teacher studies, like looking at not only what it differentiates the teachers in classrooms where students are growing academically, but what's happening in classrooms where they are developing the sense of agency and empathy and all that we need. Um, and and it's, it's a big, it's just, it's a big reorientation and I think it's so important when we think about the, the responsibility we have and the challenges facing people and, and our planet. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. Thank you for your boldness and your courage. And um, congratulations on your Lifetime Achievement Award. Thank you, Kaya. Thank you, everyone.